So you've decided that you want to start meditating. Maybe you're a busy person, you're in a demanding job, your stress levels are way higher than what you'd like them to be, or you just want to use it to improve your mental well-being. So you get back from work one day, you download a meditation app, you lie back, stick the headphones on, and then you go, I just can't meditate. I've got a million and one thoughts going through my mind. I just can't concentrate. So you jump to the conclusion that maybe meditation isn't for you because you can't focus, you can't clear your mind. Well, what if this was a completely false belief? That in actual fact, you can meditate. It's just that you're missing a key step. Well, personally, I firmly believe that this is the case for most people, and I do hear that objection quite a lot. And that's what we're going to be talking about in this episode. I'm going to be sharing with you the number one thing that prevents people from meditating effectively and how to correct it. Hey there and welcome to the Stress Less Living podcast. My name is Stephen Burns and I've been a practicing coach, trainer and hypnotherapist for 25 years. Each week I'll share easily digestible bite-sized ideas that you can immediately put into practice so that you can live a more harmonious and balanced life. Because life is challenging, but whatever we encounter, we always have a choice. We can take the easy routes or the hard routes, the low stress way or the high stress way. Well, the Stress Less Living podcast is about always looking for the easy routes in life, the low stress ways to accomplish your goals, get more of what you want and ultimately live a happy and more effortless life. So if you're looking for the perfect antidote for the chaos of modern life, my friend, you are absolutely in the right place. So let's get started. So before we take a look at the number one thing that prevents people from meditating effectively, I want to first talk about what meditation actually is. Because I think a lot of people get confused with this and that's totally understandable because there is a lot of misinformation out there. Well, meditation, when we really get down to it, is a psychological practice that involves you focusing your attention, usually inwards but not always, with the aim of creating mental clarity. So it originated from spiritual traditions, but nowadays it's become a practical tool for handling things like stress, lack of focus, and general emotional well-being. So meditation is usually synonymous with creating feelings of calm, relaxation, serenity, and peacefulness. But for me, it goes way beyond that. It can be used for so many different other applications. It can be used to be more in the present moments. It can be used to tap into what I call core states of being. So things like love, wholeness and inner peace. There can be a spiritual element to it where you connect with something greater. And also, and I think this is where a lot of meditation teaching misses a trick. It can be used to create long term positive psychological changes. Because the thing is, when you go into a state of meditation, the brain becomes more plastic. It becomes more malleable and hence changeable. So a lot of people think that the brain is fixed, that what you're given is basically your lot. But recent research into neuroplasticity has shown overwhelmingly that this is absolutely not true. That the brain is a lot more plastic than what we realise that it changes shape depending on what we focus on and in response to the demands that we place on it. And when we're kids, our brain is in a state of super plasticity. That's why kids change so quickly. They are learning machines because their brain is so malleable. But then as adults, this plasticity reduces and sometimes switches off. But it switches back on when we focus in on something and become deeply absorbed in some kind of experience. And this is what we do when we meditate. So because it creates this plasticity in the brain, it's an ideal opportunity to create some long-term positive changes. And this is one of the things I bang on about quite frequently in my own meditation method, is that you don't want to just meditate to create calm, relaxation and serenity. That's great, of course, that will be your foundation, but you also want to meditate with a purpose in mind. You want to do it to create specific changes in your life. So by the way, if you want to learn a wee bit more about the mind-blowing discoveries of neuroplasticity, it's absolutely fascinating, then I'd recommend you check out the book The Brain That Changes Itself by Norman Doig. I'll include a link to it in the show notes. So I could probably talk about what meditation is for an entire episode, and I might do that at some stage, but let's move on to what we're actually talking about in this episode, 
And that is the number one thing that prevents people from actually meditating effectively. So what is that? Well, it's simple. The key thing that prevents people from meditating effectively is that they've not taken the time to prepare to meditate. So like I said in the intro, they've maybe had a busy day, they get home, they're super stressed out, and they go, oh, I've got to relax. So they load up their favourite meditation app, they stick their headphones on, and then they go, ah, this is not working. I've got a million and one thoughts going on inside my mind. I just can't focus. And then what happens is they blame themselves. They're like, well, you know, I guess I just can't meditate. It's not for me. But in actual fact, that's just not true. It's because they've not taken the time to properly prepare for it. They're still in the day thinking about stuff that's been happening. They've got all these thought loops running around inside their minds and they're all just getting in the way. So when you meditate, you want to give weight to the pre-meditation, what you do before it. You want to create a bridge, a smooth segue between your busy working day and the meditation itself. If you don't do that, then you'll be pushing a snowball up a hill, you're fighting against it, you're trying to force yourself into a state that's very different to what you're currently feeling. So how do you actually do that? That is the key question. Well, in order to create this bridge, I recommend that you do something called centering. So centering is where you go through a process that brings you more into the present moment, that mildly relaxes you, makes you feel more physically and mentally balanced. It helps you let go of distractions so that you can focus in. And it ultimately helps you just return back to you. It helps you center yourself. And this acts as a lovely transition to take you from your hectic, busy life into the meditation itself. Because the thing is, when we are caught up in the daily whirlwind of life, it does throw us off balance, doesn't it? Every distraction that we experience, every moment of stress or adversity causes us to lose our centre. It knocks us off balance and we become disconnected with ourselves. And trying to meditate from this place is very difficult because it's like the polar opposite of the states we're looking to create. But centering is a natural way to correct all of that. So what I want to do is I want to show you two really powerful ways that can help you center so you can get into the right space to meditate. So method number one is super simple, one I'm sure you've heard of before, but it's well worth going over, and that is breathing. Now, of course, we all breathe. It's been scientifically proven that if you don't breathe, then you will die. But what you want to do with this is you want to breathe strategically. So I've talked about this quite a bit in previous episodes, but like I said, it's worth going over again because it is super simple but super powerful. So I like to do something I call strategic power breathing. Sounds very fancy, doesn't it? So when we get stressed or distracted, it tends to affect our breathing. We breathe higher up in our chest, sometimes even our throat. It becomes very forced. It becomes quite erratic. And sometimes we can actually try and breathe more in order to get air in so that we can bring ourselves back to an even keel. And what this does is it actually causes more stress because what we do physically affects our emotional state and we can end up in this kind of vicious cycle that just increases all of that tension, all of that stress. So when we breathe in a slower, more rhythmic and deeper way, then it calms down our nervous system and things start to slow down. So what I want to do is I want to give you a few options for this, different breathing patterns that you can use. If you've done yoga, then you'll most likely be sitting back going, Steve, I know all of this stuff, but hey, it's still useful to go along with it anyway. So the first one is something I'm sure you've heard of before, and that is called box breathing. It's also called equalized breath. And I think in yoga, it's called samavriti. For you yogis out there, if I've made a mistake, you can send me some hate mail. Now, please don't do that. But this is where you breathe in for the count of four, then you hold for four, then you exhale for four. So it's balanced all the way across. And what this does is it just helps you return to a state of balance. So this is a really simple one. I find this very useful, especially if you're just starting out with breath work. Another one, though, if we want to go a little bit more advanced, is where you do a ratio of one to two. So this is where you breathe in for four and out for eight. And then you repeat that for a few minutes. Now, if you're struggling with that count, if your lung capacity ain't what it used to be, then you can reduce that to in for three and out for six. The key thing is you're going for a ratio of one in terms of the in-breath 
and two for the outbreath. You're doubling the count. Hey there, if you are enjoying this episode and you'd like to learn more about the fundamentals of meditation, then I have a video course that you can enroll on for free as a podcast listener. So this is normally a paid course, but as someone who listens to the podcast, you can enroll for free using the discount code in the show notes. So if you want to check out that, like I said, I'll include a link to that free meditation course in the show notes and all the information that you need. So for me, I find this one works better than box breathing for some reason. You can play about with it and see which ones work for you. But for me, it creates a much deeper feeling of calm. And the beauty of doing strategic breathing like this is you don't have to think. It requires hardly any focus. It's something you're doing with your physiology in order to change how you feel. So that's the second option. The third option for breathing is one I absolutely love. And that is where you breathe in for four, hold for 12 and then out for eight. So only do this if you have the lung capacity to do it. I don't want you all turning blue out there trying to do this pattern. Steve said it's really powerful. Do this only if you feel able to do it. If you want to make it an easier version, you can go in for three, hold for nine and out for six. So it's a one, three, two ratio if my maths are correct. But this is a super powerful pattern and I think it really works well, certainly for me. Uh, when I do this for a few minutes, I get this sudden wave of calm that just literally engulfs me. It's pretty wild. It feels like I'm on drugs. It's, it's pretty amazing. So that's three choices you have. Experiment with them. But the key thing is you're looking to breathe strategically in order to rebalance your nervous system and bring you more into the moment. You're looking to center yourself. So if you do that for five minutes before you meditate, then the actual meditation itself will be a million times easier. A million times? Well, I'm exaggerating there slightly. I've told you a thousand times not to exaggerate, but it is super effective when it comes to creating this bridge, this smooth segue. So that is the first centering technique where you use strategic power breathing. And the second one is something called the peripheral vision technique. I absolutely love this. This has been taken from NLP, that's Neuro Linguistic Programming. So this is to do with how you use your eyes. So there are two main ways that we can use our eyes, use our vision. So we can either be in foveal vision or peripheral vision. So foveal vision is where you have a narrow focus with your eyes. You're paying attention to detail. At the extreme, it's kind of like you're in tunnel vision. So for example, say you are reading, you'll most likely be in foveal vision because you're looking at detail. You're trying to notice the, the words. If you're driving and you're squinting at a road sign, again, you'll be in foveal vision. If you're working on your computer, which many people do on a day-to-day -day basis, you'll be in foveal vision because you'll be focusing on spreadsheets or Word documents or stuff like that. So that's foveal vision. But peripheral vision is where you soften your eyes. To go into peripheral vision, you want to imagine that your eyeballs are relaxing. I know that sounds weird, but that's one of the best ways to get into it. And you just allow your vision to go a little bit blurry, a bit defocused, and your vision starts to widen. You start to become aware of what's to the left of you, what's to the right of you, what's above you and what's below you. But you don't have to move your head to see those things. You're just aware of them on the outskirts. You can't really see detail, but you're just aware of it. There's this kind of like fuzzy broadness to your vision. And the reason why these two distinctions are important is because how we use our eyes affects our experience of the world and also our mental state. So with foveal vision, it's linked to our sympathetic nervous system. So this is the part that's responsible for adrenaline and the fight or flight response. And this makes sense, of course. In prehistoric times, if you were threatened, you would either completely focus in on the threat in order to fight it, or you would be completely focused with the exit and you were looking to flee. You would be in extreme foveal vision. So foveal vision will kick in our stress responses, even if we don't want it to. And the thing is, you see this with people. If you think of someone who is really stressed or anxious, you can see it in their eyes, can't you? You know, they'll be darting all over the place. Their eyes will be really focused and they look stressed in their eyes. That's because they're in foveal vision and this is kicking in their fight or flight response. Whereas with peripheral vision, this is linked to your parasympathetic nervous system. 
This is the part of the nervous system that's linked to feelings of relaxation and calmness, and it's also linked to digestion. It also helps you see the bigger picture. It's, it's great for things like sports or for public speaking because you can see the entire audience. But the key thing is, when you go into peripheral vision, you automatically trigger feelings of calm. It switches off your stress responses and it will naturally bring you into the present moment. It's also an amazing mindfulness technique as well. You know, if you read books on mindfulness, I sometimes think that they can make it hard work and they can also be a little bit boring as well. But mindfulness is really something that you slip into. It's not something that you force or should have to work at. So when you go into peripheral vision, you naturally slip into that more mindful state where you're more aware of the fullness of your environment. So it's a wonderful way to center yourself, to calm yourself down and prepare you properly for meditation. So let's have a wee play about with this, shall we? Let's take this theory and put it into practice. If you're doing something else, you can still go into peripheral vision. So if you're cooking your dinner while you're listening to this, you can still go through this exercise. It will still work well. So what I want you to do is I want you to start off by doing foveal vision, but I want you to do it to the extreme. So I want you to pick out something in your environment and I want you to really focus in on it. And I want you to do it in quite an extreme way. So you may have to like strain your eyes a little bit, do this safely, of course, and really focus in so that you can see the detail and you're aiming a kind of hard energy towards it. And I want you just to notice what that feels like inside your body. If you do that for a reasonable amount of time, then you're probably going to start to feel a little bit tense, a little bit tight. And if you think about it, this is kind of what we do when we're working on our computer all day. So this is an example where you're in extreme foveal vision. Just notice what's going on with your body and in your mind when you do this. And then what I'd like you to do is something magical. I'd like you just to allow your eyes to soften. If you were to imagine your eyeballs were to relax and you just stopped trying to see detail, if your eyes were to stop trying to see detail, what would that feel like? And what usually happens is the eyes start to go soft and they begin to defocus. So you don't see the specifics of what's in front of you. It starts to just go a little bit fuzzy, a little bit blurry. And that's totally okay. Just a little bit defocused. And as you allow your eyes to soften and relax and stop trying to see detail, what you'll begin to notice is that your vision will begin to broaden and you can start to become aware of what's to the left of you, what's to the right of you, what's above you and what's below you. But you don't have to turn your head to see those things. You can just be aware of it in your periphery. So I want you just to spend a few moments just to get a feel for this. It sometimes takes, I don't know, just a, a few moments just to get into this. Just enjoy being in peripheral vision and notice how you feel. You might even notice how you feel different to how you felt a moment ago when you were in extreme foveal vision. Is there less tightness in your body? Is it much more relaxed? Do you feel more open? What's going on for you? So you can have a play about with this in a bit more depth after this episode and I recommend that you do that. But for just now, I just want you to gauge how do you feel? Most people say that they feel so much more relaxed, they're a bit more in the moment, they feel maybe a little bit trancy. Um, if so, amazing, that's fantastic. If not, well, it's likely just going to take a wee bit more practice. That's perfectly natural for some people, just have a play about with it. But that's the peripheral vision technique and what it does is it centres you, it brings you back into the moment, it activates the parasympathetic nervous system so it creates mild feelings of calm and relaxation. And these will all create a wonderful environment for meditation. So I'm going to leave you with those two methods for centering. Have a play about with them. But the main takeaway of this episode is that if you want to get the most out of meditation, in fact, even if you want to get it to work at all sometimes, then you need to prepare properly. You need to value what you do pre-meditation. It's all about creating that bridge, that segue, that smooth transition. So there we have it, the number one thing that prevents people from meditating effectively is where they haven't properly prepared to meditate. They haven't taken the time to create that bridge. So it feels like you're trying to force yourself into a state that feels so far away from where you currently are. And to get around this, you want to spend some time centering yourself. 
And there's a lot of different ways you can use for that, but two methods that you can have a play about with are, first of all, strategic power breathing, and I gave you three different patterns. They're all good. Experiment, see which ones you prefer. And the second method, the peripheral vision technique, and that's where you allow your eyes to relax and soften and spend a few minutes out of foveal in peripheral. This activates the parasympathetic nervous system, takes you into the moment, produces feelings of calm and relaxation, and this creates the ideal environment for meditating. So I hope you enjoyed this episode. The next time you sit down to meditate, make sure you value what you do just before it. So if you did enjoy this episode, then I would love it if you could follow or subscribe to wherever you listen to your podcasts. If you're feeling especially generous, then if you could leave me a review, that would be absolutely fantastic. It really does help. So once again, thank you for listening and I'll speak to you in the next episode. <laughs>